Hey everybody, it's Matt Shares, CEO of SBI. I'm here for another edition of the Revenue Growth Help Desk. I'm fortunate that I get to hang out with a guy I've known for 20 years, who's also the senior partner of our firm, Scott Grewer. Big Grew, how are you, brother? Doing well. Thanks for having me today. Looking forward to it. Yeah, a little internal show. So Scott and I are going to talk about um, findings from our 22nd Chief Revenue Officer Advisory Board meeting. And um, Scott had a great idea of sharing this with the marketplace based on everything that's going on right now as people get back to what they call the next normal as opposed to the new normal. But also, Scott, we had some, some pretty capable market leaders that attend this. And uh, I think it really reflected the sentiment of what so many people are trying to get done. So maybe you could introduce what the advisory board is, give a couple of examples of the types of folks on it, and then you and I are gonna hit three big insights around virtual selling, the digital experience. We're gonna talk about generating demand and how people are thinking through that. And then some insights from leading private equity firms on what they expect out of their CROs in a time like this. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect. Yeah, so the uh, Chief Revenue Officer Advisory Board is where we gather some of the best uh, Chief Revenue Officers in the market. And, uh, and there's a few things that take place. Number one, great networking. So peer networking, people learning from each other. Because when you're in that role, it's hard to make time to look outside the walls and really spend a lot of time with your peers and see what they're doing. So that's one of the big benefits that our, uh, our members take away from the, the meetings. Number two is we tackled two or three really big topics that are happening in the market. Obviously, this time, since we had it uh, during these times, COVID was one of those. And how do you overcome that? And how do we move towards that new normal? Um, as well as, you know, what a best-in-class CROs look like, and, and then some of these other topics that have been around for a long time, like virtual selling and digital, that really got accelerated because of what happened back in March and uh, what's happening still around the pandemic, and we'll talk more about that. But we had a great group join this time. Uh, a few examples of folks that joined were uh, Steve Blum from Autodesk, Jack Malloy from Motorola, we had Jeff White from Comscope. Sid Nair from uh, Rackspace, a good mix of large enterprise chief revenue officers, as well as private equity backed uh, chief revenue officers. So very good mix. They added a ton of insight and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Yeah. And uh, we did it all by Zoom, facilitated by uh, our great team of Kate and Melissa, who uh, make everything seamless and wonderful. So knuckleheads like you and I can just show up and pontificate. So. With that being said, Gru, um, I know that one of the big topics we get asked a lot about is virtual selling, how to think about digital, how do I not over-rotate, but how do I do it appropriately? So maybe share with the viewers and the listeners a couple of the key insights that you and the team learned from that one. Yeah, yeah, good discussion on that. I mean, a lot of people are talking about virtual selling, but what exactly does that mean, right? Inside sales has been the fastest growing role in sales for the last couple of years as people continue to shift, get more efficiency out of that model and actually uh, help with reach as well. But when somebody says inside sales, I always say which type? There's like eight different applications. Are they yeah. a BDR, an SDR, an LDR? Are they covering part of the market? Are they team selling? There's all these different applications. Same with when you say virtual selling. What does that mean? Right? Is it centralized? Is it decentralized? Is it working from home? So as we talk, group, one of the big emerging themes is it's not just virtual selling. It's the entire digital experience and how sales and marketing and also customer success work together and make sure they stay aligned to how that customer wants to buy. And one of the big benefits we talked about is you actually get higher selling time virtually because you don't have to travel, right? You don't have to, you're not out there in front of uh, clients as much. So how do you use that time and allocate it properly to expand the coverage? And then yeah. what, what really are the digital touch points? Which yeah. ones should you double down on? So very interesting discussion. Hey, um, Gru, I know one of the things that I took away from, from the group was <clears throat> there's always been this buzz term the last couple of years that you and I have heard around digital transformation. And, and, and nobody knew what that meant, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? As opposed to digital evolution, which to your point is how do I look at my modalities? upon how I meet my customers and prospects where they are, determine the right modality in this environment at the right cost model. 
So maybe just talk a little bit about that because we had a lot of people focusing and asking about back to base. How do I take care of my existing customers, repackaging current offerings, and, and maybe just share a little bit of insight around that whole construct of digital evolution. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as you mentioned, the key is you have to understand how to meet your customers where they are by segment. So how you serve mm -hmm. your enterprise customers versus SMB is probably very different, right? Usually down market, more digitized for obvious reasons, more cost effective, and your customers are used to buying that way down market. Um, so first you have to really understand their, their buying experience and their expectations. Uh, we see some people jump straight to technology. And yeah. How do I have Salesforce solve my issue? There's tons of tools out there that are helpful, but if they're enabling a broken process and it's not aligned to the market, it, it doesn't really work, right? Mm. So you gotta start there. Then, then the question becomes, what are you trying to drive with digital? Are you trying to have a better customer experience? Are you trying to drive sales efficiency? Are you trying to expand coverage? Are you trying to get a better interlock between marketing and sales? There's a lot of different applications of digital that can help with all those things. Yeah. So you really have to find the strategy. Okay, that's that's helpful. So hopefully folks, as Scott and I move from uh, topic one to two, you got some takeaways there. Topic two, uh, so Guru, you mentioned about selling time, but the big thing that came up from, from folks, and as we looked at the Revenue Growth Help Desk that Melissa and the team have been tracking the last 9,500 days is generating demand and how people are thinking about generating demand and who's on the hook for generating demand now that all these enterprise sellers don't get on airplanes or even get in a car and go see somebody. So talk a little bit about that, if you would. Yeah, I mean, some of the people on the phone said, you know, we were generating most of our marketing demand through events. Well, that's challenging now, right? Because your events are not happening. Now, the good news is you have extra budget, right? So what do you do with the budget? So if you have extra budget from these events, you're probably spending a good chunk of change on them. What do you do with that? Yeah. Uh, another one is, well, my salespeople are used to being in person. They're used to, you know, that's how they generate demand. They go out and they talk to people within their accounts. And a lot of our demand came within our within the, the customer base, not new logos. So what do we do there, right? We're not we're not mm -hmm. bumping into people in our accounts anymore. So a few ideas came up in, in this whole concept around sales and marketing interlock, and the percentage of leads that come from each and where you allocate budget was a pretty hot topic. Uh, what we're seeing is more budget getting allocated to marketing than in the past. Yeah. But to our point on the last section, there's more digital experience. You're selling more through content, even as a salesperson. And you really have to have that content, that digital experience to get better reach. Yeah. And you have to be super targeted with your messaging right now. You can't have a generic message. Account-based marketing is getting accelerated because of this. There's yeah. so much noise in the system. Uh, go look at LinkedIn right now. Or go look at it two days after uh, March 14th. There's so many posts yeah. and things out there. So your message is getting lost. And grew something, you know, a term that, that I heard people using, which now I'll paraphrase was like, people think about segmentation, but there's like hyper segmentation to really activate an account based message. And I think one of the things for the listeners and viewers to, to take away is context matters because people are in front of their computers and you should get a better response rate. But grew, we've seen people making the mistake from a cost savings perspective to say, I'm going to cut marketing spend. I'm not going to reallocate it, but you can only cut your way to growth, right? And obviously that's an oxymoron. You can't do that, right? So feedback or advice for those that are struggling to win that internal battle with their CFO and CEO, because I know that also came up. Yeah, and the interesting thing is we hear a lot of that in the marketplace. We just said, Matt, which is we're cutting marketing spend. With the top tier CROs who were on the advisory board, we didn't hear that very much. They had a much of a longer term view, which was refreshing. Yep. Yep. Um, if you're a CRO or CMO and you're, you're like, how do I, you know, how do I validate my budget or actually get a return? This is the time to double down on, on a return on marketing investment. And just agree across the hall, CMO, CRO on some type of attribution model. It doesn't have to be perfect. Agree on something you can both stack hands on and come to the CFO and CEO as a unified front. If you can just do that, in these times, that'll help validate the budget. And now more than ever, as a CRO, you get, you got to have your CMO uh, with the right amount of budget 
and you have to be aligned with them because if you're not, it's going to be really hard to make the number in the second half. Yeah. And for those that might be watching and saying, we don't have an attribution model, as Scott said, just pick one, whether it's first touch, multi-touch, last touch, time decay, doesn't even matter. Just pick one and anchor to it. Okay. So, girl, I'm going to hit you with the last one and then I'm going to let you go. I know that there was a lot of talk and we were fortunate to, enough to have one of the uh, top five private equity firm partners join us and he shared a lot of wisdom. And he talked about from the view of what does a great CRO look like? Like what is a market leading CRO in this environment? And there were some great takeaways by a very veteran group of what I would say, you know, some of the people you mentioned are probably gonna be in the hall of fame of uh, CROs. So maybe share a little bit of the insight that we that we got. Yeah, that was a really insightful section, and I saw the group leaning in. Um, so this uh, private equity operating partner was speaking through the lens of how do I tell if someone's a great CRO and needs to be one. So it was really insightful. And there was three things he talked about. One was sales efficiency, and that many revenue leaders, whether they're focused on it or not, come across as revenue at all costs. Right? I just need to hit the number. And the great CROs, they look at sales efficiency. And what is sales efficiency? How do we grow at a lower cost and, and improve that spread? So if right now sales rep is three million per head and we're paying two hundred grand for them, how do we pay 180 grand for four million a head? Bingo. Right? That's what strategic CROs are doing. The second big one was how do you teach the board of directors how to think about go to market? So what does that mean? Not all of the board came from a you know, CRO type role or has been in a sales leadership role. You have to set a common set of metrics and a certain way to look at the go-to-market function and set expectations early on so you're not jumping all over the place. And if you do that and you take control of the go-to-market function, you make sure you get what you need. And then the last piece was really around how do you, uh, how do you make sure you're market-driven and data-driven? The days of the field the CRO who goes out, you know, closes the deal, and you know, is, is lifted up on the shoulders of the sales team and carried through the streets is uh, is coming to an end. Unfortunately, those were fun days, but now it's uh, it's really more of running the machine. And as a CRO, you have to be market driven. You have to have yeah. different listening posts to gather that in, that intel, and you have to be incredibly data driven make informed decisions so th those were the three insights that i thought were uh, very well put well Greer, i think one of my takeaways and and you think about the amount of time we've talked to folks over the last couple of years about and a term you use the commercial supply chain i mean it's about commercial effectiveness and understanding marketing understanding sales understanding customer success but also understanding your partner ecosystem that's totally changed now because of your end markets, like you've got to be a general manager who just happens to have a sales background as opposed to a salesperson who doesn't have any understanding of business. And that's a big right. difference. Um, all right, so Guru, we know uh, we're gonna wrap up now, I guess from a, a final thoughts, um, in two months, we're gonna be releasing our research on how to make your number in 21, and we've got some pretty deep findings relative to some key verticals. Any uh, any teasers you want to give the audience as they think about what's coming out in uh, early August? Yeah, there's a few things coming that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, number one, we're going to pull that digital thread all the way through the commercial supply chain. Mm -hmm. but what does that really mean? This topic of digital, we need to do more digital and this and that. We're going to make this super tangible for the group Great. so that everyone can go act on it. Uh, another one is, is the impact of pricing on revenue and margins, and especially right now where uh, it's a little unpredictable on the marketplace. How do, you, uh, how do you use market data and make sure that you're pricing things correctly? And it might be pricing them more, it might be pricing them less. How do you control discounting, right? Some of those levers, that'll be interesting. Uh, and then I think one of the big ones is gonna be this whole virtual selling uh, the techniques and how do you pull that all the way through? I mean, it's easy to put a framework out there, but actually pulling it all the way through from market segmentation to comp to, to revenue operations, and then getting an alignment between all the functions, as you mentioned, Matt, it's a challenge right now. And everyone's scrambling to figure out the best way to do that and how long will this last. So those are a few teasers, um, and there'll be obviously a lot more in there. 
All right. Folks, I got nothing left after the big cat laid that out. So, uh, Scott, thanks for joining us. Uh, and the reason why I call him the big cat, everybody, you can't tell, but he's a very, very large American to the tune of six foot seven. And he's got hands bigger than your monitor. So until next time, I wish you good luck as you try and make your number.